Well, uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to come speak at this conference. Um, so I have to apologize that I'm a little bit sick right now, so uh, my voice is not very strong. Um, so I'm going to be giving this talk in my Batman voice. Uh, anyway, so um, I want to work over um, characteristic zero. And this isn't really necessary, but it saves me some trouble to say that the field is algebraically closed. And so our objects of study these are going to be pairs. So X delta satisfying certain conditions. And so X projective I want the pair itself X delta to be log canonical and I also need a kind of um, log Calabi-Yau condition that minus KX plus delta is nef. And uh, one more thing, I want to say what I mean by toric. Say that a pair x delta is toric if x is a toric variety. And the um, components of delta are torus invariant and have coefficient one. Um, of course, when I say toric variety, I really mean normal. Um, and uh, the one thing I want to point out about this definition is that I don't require that I have all the components. So delta could be zero. I still consider that a toric pair. And that's just going to make my um, life easier when it comes to stating theorem. So that's all the reason I have for making that definition. So, so given a pair like this, or just generally a log canonical pair, I can uh, assign some numbers to it. So the first is going to be the dimension of x. So this is, you know, pretty familiar object. Um, and I can also, well, do, I, do I need to adjust the mic? Anyway, um, so, so I can write delta as a sum of its components with multiplicities. And I just want to define, I guess I can call this like the, the magnitude of delta or like the norm of delta equals just the sum of these coefficients. And then finally, I'm going to write rho of x delta and this will be the rank of the rational vector space. Generated by the components. Um, and then I want to think of this happening in phi divisors mod algebraic equivalence. Okay, um, usually I'm just going to assume that x is q factorial and then I can just think of this as the Picard rank. Okay, so once I have all these numbers, I want to put them together in a particular way.
and I just take the, the sum of the dimension in the Picard rank minus the sum of the components. Okay, so this is hopefully pretty straightforward. Um, and I think uh, I should give you an example to <coughs> maybe demonstrate why this is an interesting number to look at. So if, let's say xd is toric and d is the whole um, torus boundary. So by that I just mean all of the, um, oh yeah, I don't want to be projective. So by that I mean all of the invariant divisors. Then, well, certainly this is log canonical. I also have that k x plus d is equal to zero, so minus this is nef. And then we can compute this complexity. C of x d is equal to well, n the dimension plus rho, which is the card rank, and then minus the number of divisors, but the dimension plus the card rank is the number of rays in the fan, which is which is this, so this is actually equal to zero. So just to illustrate this with a concrete example, uh, x equals pn, d equals h0 plus h1 plus up through hn, uh, hn the uh, coordinate hyperplanes, then uh, c of x d, so I have n, this is the dimension, I have 1, this is the card rank, and then I subtract uh, n plus 1, and then this is like number of divisors, this equals zero. Okay, so now I am ready to state the uh, theorem I want to present today. So this is joint work with uh, several co-authors, uh, McKernan, Spaldi, and Zong. Okay, so I'm going to say that x delta is a, let's just say projective, but it even works for proper, um, log canonical pair. And I need my positivity condition that minus kx plus delta is nef. Okay, then the first thing we get is that this invariant, the complexity, is greater than or equal to zero. So when you have a toric variety with the, the torus boundary, that's the most extreme case that can happen. Um, number two is a little bit wordy, but this is like the best way I could state it, is that if C of x delta, the complexity is less than one, then if we look at the round down, this pair is toric. So this means that x is a toric variety and all of the elements of delta that have coefficient one since it's log canonical, that's the largest the coefficients can be. All of those appear in the torus boundary. Moreover, um, so we can choose the torus boundary D. Such 
that at most one component of D is not a component of delta. And then also if C of X delta is less than a half, um, every component of D is a component of delta. Okay, so <coughs> this is a little bit wordy, um, but this theorem is actually quite sharp and I want to illustrate that by means of uh, several examples before I go into talking about some of the ingredients of the proof. So, um, so hopefully it'll, I mean this statement too seems a little bit clunky, but it, it will hopefully seem a little more natural once I go over some examples. So, So my first example, <coughs> just want to take the simplest surface I can, which would be x is p2. And then no matter what I choose for my boundary, it's going to be some, some combination of curves in p2. And if I want to require that minus kx plus delta is nef, well, that's going to imply that the total degree of this divisor is going to be less than or equal to 3. So that says that if I sum the bi's times the degree of the components, this is less than or equal to 3. Okay. In the meantime, so the condition on our theorem, condition 2, If C of P2 delta is less than 1, well, as long as we, so we know that the, di the dimension is 2. So certainly the theorem holds for the empty divisor when, when, when I have just uh, P2 comma 0. So <coughs> I can assume I have at least one component um, to make this interesting. And that means the uh, the card rank generated by those components is going to be 1. And then I just subtract off the sum of the coefficients. So this being less than 1 says that 3 minus this sum is less than 1. So the sum of the bi's is greater than 2. Okay, and it doesn't hurt me at all to order my components in such a way that they have increasing degree. It just makes things a little more convenient. So, do that. So delta 1 through delta sub k1 are going to be lines. Delta sub k1 plus 1 up to delta sub k2 are conics. And then, you know, etc. Go on as far as you like. Um, but what we have is my first inequality that comes from the positivity condition says that 3 is greater than or equal to the sum of the weighted sum of these degrees or let's say the, the sum of the bi is weighted by the degrees. Um, and then, so these degrees are always at least one. For lines, they're ex the lines are they're exactly equal to one, and it's always an integer. So I can write this as, this is greater than or equal to the sum of all the bi, and then I just add on one more for the bi's that come from conics or higher degree curves. But 
But on the other hand, I know that this sum right here, um, yeah, this sum right here is at least two. Okay, so this tells me that if I look at the sum of the coefficients of the higher degree curves, this is less than one. So since the sum of all the curves, the coefficients of all the curves was at least two, that means the sum of the coefficients of the lines is greater than one. And then I conclude delta contains at least two lines. Okay, and that's exactly what the theorem says. Because if I think about P2, if I impose the structure of a torque variety on it, the uh, torus boundary components are lines. And saying that um, at most one component of the torus boundary is missing from delta, that means that there have to be two lines in delta. So we've proven two for, uh, um, for, P, for the case where x equals p2, at least the non-trivial. Uh, I guess I didn't actually prove this part, but I've proven the second part of two. Okay. <coughs> and then just an example to see that three is sharp. I could also take x equals p2. And then I can take a line, a second line, and then a conic. But I want to take that conic with multiplicity one half. And so this way the total degree is going to be three. So here I have that kp2 plus l1 plus l2 plus a half c is equal to zero. Um, but I also have that if I look at the complexity, C of P2 with this divisor, well, that's equal to 2 plus 1 dimension Picard rank minus 1 plus 1 plus a half. So I cancel the 2, cancel half of the 1. This equals a half. And you can see that this. <coughs> satisfies the conclusion of two, but not three. Because if I had every component of D being a component of delta, that would mean I had three lines that were in general position, whereas I only have two in this case. So um, the point of these examples is to hopefully convince you that like, this really is the right statement. Even if it looks a little clunky, it's quite sharp. Okay, um, so I have a few more examples prepared. <coughs> So these will be a bit shorter. Um, so the next example is if you take a quadric hypersurface in Pn plus one, and I want to choose it so that the hypersurface is smooth, and I want to require n to be at least three. Well, in this case, the adjunction formula tells me that kq is equal to O of minus n for this embedding. Um, and then if I want the smallest complexity possible, well, that'll be achieved in the following situation. Um, so <coughs> I chose um, and greater than equal to three so that I would have the Lefschetz hyperplane theorem so that the only divisors on the uh, quadric hypersurface are going to uh, be inherited from the ambient projective space. And so the best I can do is when delta is the sum of n general hyperplanes. Actually. 
and then in that case, I can compute my complexity. This is n plus 1. This is the dimension of card rank, the number of components. This equals 1. And <coughs> when you can observe here that uh, with these conditions, this quadric is not a torque variety. Once it's not singular. Okay. So, yeah, maybe it's good to leave the theorem on the board. <laughs> Example three is quite short. I take x equals e curve of genus one. Delta equals zero. Then ke is trivial, so I automatically get that minus ke plus delta is an f. Um, but you can see that the complexity of this pair so now there's no divisors to generate anything, so you just get the dimension is equal to 1. So in particular, once you break through this 1, you no longer even get rationality. However, if you kind of massage what, um, if, you, if you replace this with a slightly different definition, that incorporates the card number of the whole variety instead of um, the card number generated by the components of delta then you do get a rationality statement, and if I have time, I'll talk about that at the end of the talk. <laughs> um, so the next example illustrates that we really do need uh, this condition of delta being log canonical, which, I mean, I think I just include this for when I'm not talking in front of birational geometers, but, uh, you know, uh, in more general audiences, you kind of need to justify this like, log canonical condition. I think in a crowd like this, maybe I don't, but I'll give the example anyway. Um, so let's say, Let's let x be a projective quadric cone in P3, and then delta is equal to four lines. And of course, you know, if you know, if you think about what the rulings are in a quadric cone, that means these all have to go. The, the ruling is rather um, these all have to go through the cone point. Um, so here's the picture. I have my cone. Um, I guess it's a good time to use the colored chuck. Okay. And in this case, if you just say, well, let's, let's take a look at this and compute the complexity. The Kx plus delta is equal to zero, so this condition is nice. Um, I have the dimension of x equals one, uh, sorry, is two, and then row equals one, and then I have four lines, so four components. So I get one plus two minus four is equal to minus one, it's less than zero. This is our complexity. And <coughs> You can see, well, this seems to violate the theorem, but the point is that once you have four lines through this point, you've, you know, you've, you've lost the condition that this is all canonical. So, like I said, you know, you can, <coughs> there are examples that that show that this theorem is actually pretty sharp. Okay. So I want to say a little bit about um, uh, the strategy of the proof. So, 
the first thing we're going to need is a local version of the theorem. So um, this I think is well known um, and it's the reference I always use is flips in abundance. I think it's section 18 but uh, maybe I won't write it down because I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, in a minute I'll expand some of these um, bullet points. Um, oh, actually, sorry, I skipped something. Um, I just want to—I just want to make some remarks about the theorem to uh, mention some previous work. Um, so. <coughs> the theorem was conjectured by Shokurov in the relative setting. Although when I look at his paper he doesn't actually say conjecture, it's more that he proves some cases and then says it would be nice if this were true. Um, and maybe it was James who elevated this to the status of conjecture, but uh, if you ask him he denies it of course. Um, so. I mean, the statements like this were floating around before, and you can trace them back, I think, to Shakurov. Um, and then there's a lot of previous results. Um, so, of course, there's work of uh, Shakurov in the, um, I mean, this is, he proves the relative case where you, instead of just having kx plus delta uh, is minus enough divisor, you have that for kx over some variety z. Um, he d does that for surfaces. Um, and then there's work of Prokhorov on uh, three folds. Um, there's some unpublished work of Cheltsov, uh, which actually inspired a lot of the techniques we're going to use. <coughs> and there's a student of Sean Keel, uh, Yao, who um, <coughs> gave a proof in the case where you have uh, all the coefficients are one, and you have a simple normal crossing divisor. Um, and that uh, that work uses very different techniques that are related to these uh, um, approaches to mirror symmetry, like uh, with gross Zebert and gross hacking keel. Um, so you know there might be some interesting connections there, although I I couldn't really say. Um, anyway, so yeah, back to. Strategy of the proof. Okay. So, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and state the local version of this theorem. This can be found in flips in abundance. Uh, so if pair x delta is log canonical, here you see, um, then the co dimension of z is greater than or equal to the sum of the bi and then I want the delta i's uh, all containing z um, and you know I mean you can sharpen this statement um, depending on like you know if x isn't q factorial near z you get a uh, a term that sort of corresponds to the card number coming from that, but I, I don't want to worry about that. So this is like the dimension. This is like the sum of the components, and then I've, um, if, it, um, and then there's, uh, yeah, I mean, and then, and then, you know, you could put another error term coming from, uh, uh, coming from sort of the failure of this to be Q factorial or something. So let's just say this is Q factorial. Um, anyway, so 
in this case, if equality holds. So this is the so this is the part that's like the bound number one. And then if equality holds along z, x has finite abelian quotient singularities. And then, so if in addition, all delta i are Cartier, then x is smooth. And in fact, you prove this statement by proving this statement first by going to a cover where the delta i's are Cartier. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about the strategy of how one proves a theorem like this. <laughs> and as hinted by the way I'm talking about the local version, we want to bootstrap this result into the global case. Um, and so this unpublished work of Sheltsov that I'm referring to, um, he, he does that for in the Picard rank one case for cones. Um, and so we want some version of the cone construction that works uh, when you have a larger Picard rank. And so, um, as you know, the, the, I think we know now that the right thing to do is to take the Cox ring in that case. Okay, so the strategy. So I guess the slogan is apply the local version to the Cox ring. of x. Okay, and so, uh, so there's a couple of <coughs> obstacles you have to overcome now. So one key result that makes the whole machine go is that if x is a Mori dream space and kx plus delta is trivial and x delta it is log canonical. Well, then this implies that if I look at spec of Cox X and then, you know, the corresponding divisor on that sort of generalized cone, that this is a log canonical pair. So, um, so this direction. Uh, follows from work, work I did in my thesis. Um, so the in, independent work done by uh, Ganyo, uh, Okawa, Sanai, and Takagi, which establishes a converse to this statement. Um, and then there's a corresponding statement for log phonos and uh, KLT singularities. Uh, and then uh, the version that we actually used in the paper is due to work of Kawamata and Okawa. So what this lets us do is if we knew that X was a Mori dream space, and so the, uh, a big chunk of the rest of the talk is going to be <coughs> about how you reduce to the case where X is a Mori dream space, I think that's where a lot of the most interesting arguments in the proof sort of show up. Um, if you knew this, then, you know, minus kx plus delta being nef, that's as good as this because you can just add on some extra semi-ample piece to, to um, you know, um, to, make kx plus to make kx plus delta trivial and then, um, you know, you have to worry about the Picard rank, but it's actually not a problem. Um, so if you knew this, then you can reduce to the local case and then you get some information about the Cox ring from the local case, and then that lets you uh, deduce the theorem. So, so for that step, this is a well-known uh, theorem also, is that if Cox X is smooth, or let's say regular, because I'm talking about rings, well, so then this implies that since it's a graded ring, it's a polynomial ring. And 
And then this is if and only if x is toric. And so then this is a theorem due to Cox and Hugh Keel. I mean, so this was the paper, which is why we call these Cox rings. And then this is Ewan Keel's famous Mark Dream Spaces paper. And you know you can get a little more out of the argument. Um, not only is x toric, but then the generators of the ring um, are, <coughs> if you take a minimal, you know, generators for your polynomial ring, as long as they're graded, they give you torus boundary components, and that's how you get statements like these. Okay, so the key step that I want to focus on is we want to reduce to the case x is a Mori dream space, but I don't really know that many ways of proving that x is a Mori dream space. Um, there's kind of like, well, the one everyone knows is that if x is log Fano, then it's a Mori dream space. Uh, I mean, there's a few other ways to do it, but this is kind of the most well-known and powerful one. Uh, and we do this by using MMP. And I guess I should really say MMP with scaling. Um, not just because like this is the version of MMP we know. So of course the MMP with scaling and the version I'm going to use it is due to Berker, Cusini, Haken, and McKernan. Um, <coughs> and uh, so it, it somehow like the fact that it's a scaling argument makes the arguments I'm about to present like much easier to do. <laughs> okay, so. it's time for some birational geometry. So from now on, I want to make the following assumption that x delta is q factorial. And DLT. So this is a more or less standard reduction step. You can do it, but I don't want to go talk about the details right now. Um, and the reason I want DLT is this way. If delta prime is slightly less, and I'll be imprecise about this, then delta then x delta prime is KLT. And so this is what lets me run, run the minimal model program. So now I choose A ample. And then I run the KX plus delta prime MMP with scaling. Okay, so we know from <coughs> from BCHM that if you if this log canonical divisor is not um, pseudo effective, then this MMP will terminate in a Mori fiber space. And so uh, here's my diagram. I have some birational maps. Get me down to some variety y. And my divisor comes along for the ride. And then this fibers over z. And then uh, let's say all I need is the general fiber satisfies. F comma gamma of F is log canonical, and that minus KF plus delta F is ample. Okay, so this is the situation I find myself in. Um, oh yeah, I should point out that so so we're using the fact that minus KX plus delta is Neff here, because that's how we know that minus this, 
because this is bigger than a NEF divisor, so it has to be pseudo-effective. So it's negative, it's not pseudo-effective. So that's how we get this kind of termination. Okay. So what I'd like to do is to do a little bit of bookkeeping on the components of delta. And what I'm interested in is how they behave with respect to z. So I'm going to say that a component um, of delta is, so it's horizontal or vertical. So if it dominates z, I suppose, I, I mean, this should really be horizontal with respect to this MMP or something, but you know, um, there will be no ambiguity. Um, and then, so vertical otherwise. Um, so, I mean, just the main thing to keep in mind is, so here's my picture, here's x, here's y, and here's z. or something so that they're the strict transforms. And the point is that delta E and delta V are vertical. Delta H is horizontal. So it's, it's sort of intuitively clear that horizontal guys just, you know, they look like a they look like a divisor when you restrict them to some fiber of the map. And then vertical guys, they can just be fiber, like, um, they can be the fibers of our divisors in Z themselves, or they can be exceptional. So I want to include both of these in my notion of vertical because I want to treat them sort of uniformly. Okay, so, so here's kind of the trick. Um, yeah, I guess I can erase it now. So let's, you know, so you have some components that are vertical and some that are horizontal and you want to make some kind of argument. Um, so what I want to suppose first is that I just have no vertical components, that every component is horizontal. So if every component is horizontal, If I just compute the complexity on the fiber, then it's the same, it looks the same as computing the complexity on Y, except the dimension changes and maybe I have some new relations in the Picard group or something like that. But what that means is that I can only decrease here. So I get C of Y gamma minus the dimension of Z. And it's actually a fact that this running the middle of the model program is only going to decrease this complexity. So this is less than or equal to C of X delta minus the dimension of Z. So the punchline here is that, so if the, if, if the dimension of Z is zero, then we win automatically because I've reduce to the case where I have a, a log fano because every, like a fiber is just y. So that's a good case. On the other hand, if the dimension of z is positive and this was less than one, then I got a contradiction with the theorem at a lower dimension. So by induction, um, I have to have either that z is a point or that there's at least one vertical component. So if C of X delta is less than one, either dim Z equals zero, or 
um, there's a vertical component. Okay, and so now it's time to draw the big MMP picture. So this was the big MMP diagram, and now I want to draw a picture of what's actually happening in the effective cone. Um, so let's see. Where did I hide this diagram? There it is. Okay. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is I want to actually do a kind of a descending induction on the dimension of Z. So I want to use this vertical component to decrease the dimension of Z. So here's my picture. So this is the ample cone. And then somewhere on the, uh, let's do it like this. So somewhere on the boundary of the ample cone, say, is minus kx plus delta. And then, since I'm running the MMP really with these KLT divisors, I can, you know, I can, I can change my minus kx plus delta by making the coefficient smaller, which in the minus means I'm adding on the multiples of the components. So I get some, you know, extra polyhedral cone where this is like uh, minus kx plus delta prime and x delta prime, and so this is like delta prime less than or equal to delta x delta prime klt. So I have a cone like this. Um, and then, you know, so I have my original delta, delta prime, which starts somewhere in here, and then I have some ample divisor that I'm uh, using to run MMP, which let's say is here, so this is my A. And so then I run MMP with scaling and I go along this ray. And so, and so, you know, this ample cone is labeled with X. I have some chambers in the middle, but then the last chamber I get to is labeled with Y and then over here is Z. Okay, and now, if I have a, uh, the observation you have to make is that if you have a vertical component delta V, then, well, this corresponds to some, something in the pseudo-effective cone. And it certainly has to be a direction like one of these because I can decrease delta, delta V and X delta and, um, and since it's a component and get some, and maybe decrease some other stuff and get something KLT. Um, but the other thing you note is that it actually also has to lie along this face of the effect of the pseudo-effective cone, because if you think about this picture here, I can um, I can sort of um, dominate delta v by an ample divisor down here, and then instead of subtracting off delta v leaves me still in the pseudo-effective cone, but adding it does too, so that means it has to be in a face. And so, all that information tells me that delta V has to be, um, okay, to make my picture realistic, it has to look like this. Um, yeah, maybe it's something like, that. anyway, so. That delta V is like down here. Okay. And so what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to produce a new model Z prime up here by going in the opposite direction. And I can always do that because I can scale this divisor in this direction and then I can scale the ample divisor along this line connecting this NEF divisor with this. So. So I scale this guy to here, this ample guy to here, and then I come up with a new MMP. So here this is also ample. I'll just call this like A prime. Uh, I'll call this like minus KX plus delta prime. And then the result of the X delta prime MMP with scaling with respect to A gives me this Z prime. 
And then you can easily show that the dimension is actually decreased. Okay, so that's kind of the key, or at least the most interesting key technical step of the proof. Um, so, I mean, there's a whole bunch I'm glossing over, like, you know, the main thing you have to worry about is that as you run this MMP, there are divisors that you lose, and you have to make sure that didn't do anything that, you know, messes you up. Um, and, you know, it's, I mean, there's some technical arguments you can do that sort of smooth everything over. Um, but I'll be happy to talk about those privately if you if you like. Um, instead, with the remaining time, I want to talk about um, <coughs> um, a slightly different version of this theorem that says something about rationality. So now we're just starting over from square one. So if you, know, if you were lost at that point, then uh, you can start paying attention again if you want. Um, so let's see. Uh, um, let's say, suppose x delta is q factorial log canonical and projective and then I want to define um, gamma of x delta I'm going to call this the absolute complexity um, this is n plus so now instead of rho of x delta this is just the Picard rank of x this is the dimension and then minus the sum of the bi. So this, I guess we can say, is like the rank of the nair in very space. Okay, and then... And so the reason we want to use this absolute complexity is to rule out stuff like elliptic curves. So just for brevity's sake, I'll just say x delta as above and minus kx plus delta is nef. Um, actually, let's just say this is equal to zero. Because I, I forget what we actually prove. I think we do prove it for nef though. Um, then if gamma of x delta is less than 3 halves and class group of x has no 2 torsion then x is rational okay so I just want to say this was conjectured in a slightly different form uh, by McKernan. Um, basically, in McKernan's paper, he had two here, and not this condition. This seems like a kind of a weird condition, right? Um, but uh, yeah, so I want to actually tell you that you need this condition. There are counterexamples if you don't have it, uh, which was quite surprising. And um, I think, so what happened was we had a proof um, where we didn't have this. Uh, and then Roberto found a hole in it. And then we spent ages trying to fix the hole. And then we eventually found a counterexample. Uh, so I was really happy to find a counterexample because I was tired of trying to fix the hole. Uh, I think James was a little less happy because it was his conjecture. Um, but, you know, I think um, it's always nice when you have a theorem that has funny statements in it if you have a way of showing that they're actually sharp. Um, so, uh, as far as the techniques for proving this go, there. Codes over any field? Uh, good question. Let me just say for k equals c, 
Although, I need to talk to James about this because one of the counterexamples in the paper is, is working over R. Um, yeah, I think you need algebraically closed for this to make sense. Okay, so. Yeah, the statement makes sense. Uh, oh, yeah, the statement makes sense. Um, <laughs> I, I will state it for algebraically closed. Yeah. Okay, so, so for the proof of this, it's, it proceeds in a similar way. And um, what happens there is that this condition lets you say that the, that the Cox ring has a uh, compound Duval singularity. Um, and then you can kind of start writing down equations and you get something where you look at the quadratic term and then this two torsion condition pops up because you have something like x naught squared plus x1 squared and you want to make that look like x naught times x1 or y naught times y1 and being able to do that requires saying that x naught and x1 have the same class because x x naught squared and x1 squared have the same class. Um, and I think once you realize this you can uh, start being able to cook up a counterexample. So hopefully I have to get to this. Okay, so the picture here is I take uh, x p1 cross p1, and this is a conic bundle. And so if p1 cross p1 right here, then I have some conic bundle where there's a discriminant locus that sits over a curve. Okay, this is not a great picture. That's a slightly better picture. And so I'm writing the discriminant locus like this because um, this conic bundle is gonna have relative Picard number two. Okay, and then <coughs> down here I want a two to one quotient map that just sends, uh, let's see, I think this is what I want. So all I'm doing is um, acting with a Z2 on each P1 individually to get a Z2 quotient. And this takes me down to a singular toric surface T. And I want to choose C. And I can do this just by making the degree large. I want to choose C to be a smooth curve that's invariant under this action. Or not, not invariant, I mean, so that the curve itself is fixed. The, the points will be switched. So it gives me a two to one map on the curve as well. So I get a cover down to this C prime. And the point is that you can get an induced conic bundle here, but the Picard number goes down because you are identifying these two sheets. Okay, and then this is my Y. And then this guy, you can, you can write down a divisor on this that has complexity. Uh, there exists gamma such that the complex the absolute complexity is one, but y is not rational. So the irrationality follows from basically judicious choice of this curve or general choice of this curve from the standard arguments of uh, using the intermediate Jacobian and uh, work of Shakurov, for example. Um, but out of time, so thanks for your attention. Yeah. So what if your x is smooth and all the coefficients are at most one? All right. But no log canonical assumption. Uh oh, if it's 
Yeah, I guess the example I gave wasn't smooth. Um, I feel like surely I ought to be able to cook up an example, but I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, That's a good question. Yeah, I'm, I can't think of anything on the spot, but I'll, I'll give it some thought.